We are in Champions League, man. That was my dilly next question. Dilly dong, come on. Into Sheringham and so sure and funny. I will love it if we beat them. Love it. This is the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast with Gary Kearney. Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. Joining us today is Paul Bright. Paul is a UEFA A license and USSF coach instructor. He is also technical director for the coaching manual and a national technical director for AYSO United. So we talk about coaching communication, both on and off the pitch, how it's changed, how we can improve it, how we can expand it to simply be on the training session. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on this at Gary Kernin on Twitter, at Gary Kernin on Instagram. This podcast is brought to you by Foundation Coach Education, looking to elevate the standards of coaching and coach education in Texas and the United States. They are delighted to host the very first Soccer Coach Development Conference in Houston, Texas on August 10th and 11th. They'll be featuring lectures and field presentation from expert coaches, coach educators and former podcast guests like Kieran Smith, Saul Isaacson Hurst, David Garcia and Stevie Greve. They also have the current England under 19 head coach and the man who led England to World Cup victory in 2017, Paul Simpson. So highly recommend you check out that event in Texas on August 10th, 11th, foundationcoached.com. Paul Bright and I planned this podcast a while ago. We actually met at a coach education event ourselves in Iowa, the Iowa Soccer Symposium. So these events are fantastic to hear different perspectives, to meet new people, but also then to get access to the coaches, the presenters for a coffee or dinner and a bit of downtime as well. So absolutely brilliant. Recommend you check it out. Here is Paul. Enjoy. Friday, thanks very much for joining me this morning, your time on the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. Finally, excited to have you on. <laughs> thanks, Gary. Thanks for setting this up. We're looking at improving coaching communication on and off the pitch. And the first one I wanted to really hit you with was, you know, we've I know we talked quite a bit about the glory days and, and when we were growing up, whenever we were in uh, in Iowa. And I just yeah. wanted to revisit that co- conversation and and kind of get a feel of you know, how you think communication specifically has changed on the pitch since we were growing up. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a great, it's a great open question, Gary, because there's so much what's, you know, so much development in terms of coach education and technology and everything, what's happened since we, we used to play out on the park and the pet and the playground. So communication in terms of communication channels and how how you can get information to players has definitely changed. And I know in Iowa we discussed about you know when we when we were youngsters and, and this is for for many people who'll be of a similar generation to us. You play out on the park, you play out in the streets, and and some of that communication on the pitch wasn't coming from coaches. It was coming from your older peers and. And your friends, older brothers, who would if you could if you could compete with them, they'd let you play. And and you know some of the examples I've got is obviously where where I'm from in, in the northwest of England, which is a hotbed for football. There was guy there was older players there who were playing on the streets with us, but were in centres of excellences and academies. And they would they would bring the information they're getting from their professional coaches to to the street football in the park. Football, so they they'd be telling you certain things, even even on the playground when it's you know twenty versus twenty one or or just a little four v five or whatever. And that communication was, it was reciprocal learning really. It was peer to peer. It was older brothers passing it down to the younger players. And then when we'd have younger players play with us, obviously there's that modelling, and we we communicate the same way in that in that sort of detail. Um, I think in terms of the modern game now, technology's got a huge part to play in communication with with young players now playing the game so using you know using analysis software using you know being able to digitally send session plans out to players being able to follow up on individual on a one-to-one basis giving them feedback um, can be done remotely through technology so 
Um, I think communication has definitely changed. In terms of on the pitch, the information should be the same because the game hasn't changed um, since since we were youngsters. Um, so, you know, communication, it's definitely changed. And I think when I was a young player, you know, and I'm sure we'll get on to this, uh, the coaches back in the UK can could be very abrasive and very abrupt, but they're trying to, trying to take you on that journey of development and that I'd say that's been the biggest change. Staying on that one then, whenever you observe those training sessions at Manchester United and, and Sir Alex Ferguson was in his pomp at that stage, were there certain aspects of communication that jumped out at you on and off the pitch with him or the team? Yes, definitely. Um, I was, I've been very, very lucky um, to coach at a club like Manchester United as a young coach and really cut my teeth there working under Rennie Mullenstein and being able to observe the whole academy process from a young, as a coach at a young age. So um, I think one of one of the biggest examples I've got is it wasn't even communication. It, it was it was just presence. You know, with, with with the boss, with Sir Alex, there was a training session I observed one time, and Tony Strudwick took them through the the physical warm up, and then when he was out on the field at the time as a first team coach working with them. And the tempo was great. The players were working hard. And then Sir Alex walks out and he's not even delivering the session. And it was noticeable to see the standard because of his presence just go through the roof. So everyone was like, right, the boss is here. And you could physically see the players. And I don't think they were, you know, they weren't cheating anyone when there was when the boss wasn't at the side. But it was just that presence. In terms of communication on the field, you know, pleasure to work under Rennie and know Rennie and his his attention to detail is probably what stood out, the little things, um, working with individual players a lot. Um, and again, the manner was very, you know, very positive. Um, you know, you're dealing with Premier League players at the end of the day um, and observing those Premier League players. And it, it was a very positive tone and a very positive manner. But all of, all of Sir Alex's communications, for the most part on the training ground, were positive. Um, were motivational from what I saw um, and that fed right the way through the club you know a lot of clubs in the philosophy now you know we want to develop people first and then players um, for me Manchester United did epitomise that um, it, it was about being a good person they wanted good lads in there that you know always shaking hands as you walk down the corridor it doesn't matter if you're a first team player or a U9 academy player you'd be shaking hands with anyone who walked past hello good morning good afternoon um, and again that sort of communication creates that environment for an open dialogue on the game and, and things outside of the game yeah just to go back there on on that presence piece that you said about Sir Alex you do a lot and now in coach education so and coaching particularly in this country we, we talk about standards high and energy yep. from coaches. And I, th- I almost think that we've kind of gone the, the other way a bit too much. When you look at Klopp and Pep, they're so animated. When you look at the NCAA basketball tournament, every coach is sweating buckets because they're running as much as the players. Football's not far behind it. But then in soccer, how do you educate a coach or how do you make them aware of that moment? Can you create a presence, Paul? I think you can. I think it's. I think it's about respect, and I think it's about the players understanding that first and foremost, you've got their best interests as a person, and you can say that. But if you're going through the motions, you know, you, even young players, they're, they're very, very sharp and switched on. Young people are switched on. They, they can tell if you're being false or not, and that takes time. You know, you've got to. You've got to go in and, and win the hearts and minds, so to speak, of the players and show that you've got their best interests as a person at heart. And it's, you know, how's school going? How's this going? But it can't be scripted. It's got to be natural. You've got to be naturally able to connect with those young people. Alongside that, I think, you know, you mentioned a word what I use quite a lot with with coaches and with teams and, 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 and players I work with. And it's about standards and expectations. Very, very simple. You know, these are the standards here and this is what we expect from you and this is what you can expect from from myself as a coach. Um, and I think when the most powerful most powerful um, tool is when the players themselves set, maintain the standards, if you like. So they can be set as a group. There's always non-negotiables, but 
I've coached in environments, and, and I remember working with an under eighteen squad, um, and it and it took me around three months, and it was just going round and whispering into the ears of some of the players. You know, are you happy with the passes that you're getting there? You know, is, is your teammate working hard enough there? It wasn't for me to call those players out. These were U eighteen players. Now they were t- they were young men, and and the. The, the penny dropped one day and I saw it in a game where one of our midfielders dropped for the ball to receive it off a centre-back and the centre-back booted it long. And the midfielder absolutely went bananas at him, but positively like, you've got to trust me, give me the ball when I come and ask for it. And rather than the centre-back getting into an argument with his team, he's like, yep, no problem. And that was sort of the standards and expectations aligned with how we wanted to play. And when you, when you get to that level where the players own the standards and expectations, that's when, for me, magic happens. I know um, we discussed it about, you know, Roy Keane in his autobiography saying, you know, it was harder in training sometimes than some Premier League games he played in because the standards that the players themselves in the first team at Manchester United set the standards. And that's the environment you've got to create. It does come from the coach. And I think the presence is then they understand the standards and expectations, the coach is there to oversee those standards and expectations are being met. But the power has to be with the players. So, yes, I think you can create presence. You need to be natural. can't be scripted. Players will, will see right through you. Um, but you, as a coach, you set the standards and expectations with your player and you don't budge away from those. Tough coaching, you mentioned it just at the start there, whatever, growing up and, and people were in environments that it was... They were coming back to the playground from hard coach environments. And yep. terribly, we associate that back home with bad language. Um, and that's something that we probably grew up with in our coaching. I know I definitely did. That under 12, getting exposed to a hell of a lot of bad language. Is it, yep. is it ever acceptable for a youth coach from the whole spectrum, U6, U6 to U18, is bad language ever acceptable? I don't think it is. Um, and again, there's a big spectrum there. Young, young players, absolutely not. There's, again, it, it is a game. It's The game is meant to be fun. No matter what level you're playing at, it's meant to be fun. So if you're cursing and using bad language and getting aggressive and angry, it's a game. You know, Again, Manchester United's academy, one of the top academies in the world, Tony Whelan and those guys, they used to say to all the players, you've got to play with a smile on your face. This is fun. We want to see you enjoying yourself. So there's a lot of pressure for young players because they know that there's 100, pe- 100 other young me- young boys waiting around the block to take their spot at any time. So is the pressure, but but does that have to have to equate to using bad language because if it's a bad result, it's a game. It's a game at the end of the day. So I, I don't think it's ever acceptable. Um you, I can totally understand when you start getting to 16, 17, 18 years old in a professional environment that that may go on because you can't sugarcoat everything. And, and if the, some of these young young boys, especially in Europe, maybe maybe in the, you know maybe a game or two away from playing with the first team. But again, in terms of bad language, I think I think generations have changed, times have moved on. I think coaches are more aware of of um you know how they communicate to players and how they're how, how they're perceived as well so is bad language needed no i think it i don't think it is at all and i don't think it's acceptable no oh another trend i wanted to get your thoughts on was coaching community where you know t- tactical analysis and monday night football syndrome has almost gone global well we're all loving breaking down every aspect. Not really solution based, but more just living in the past. That we we seem to be drawn to coaches to to be able to pinpoint mistakes and hold out where things went wrong. And in half time team talks in particular, how do you move away, or how can coaches move away from telling everyone where they went wrong in the first half to maybe putting a few processes or structures in place to to maybe get players a little clear and what they need to do for the remainder of the game. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in that question, I think you answered some of it there, Gary, because it is about processes. Um, you know, half time, and again, you see the all or nothing documentary with Pep, and then all of a sudden everyone's moving magnets around on a board at <laughs> 100 mile an hour, you know. Um, again, are we going over Are we going over things that have happened? You know, I don't have a DeLorean, I can't, I can't change what's gone on. 
However, we can affect future performance even at half time. So the biggest tips I have for youth coaches are have a game plan. What what's what do you want your your players to achieve in possession and out of possession before the game even kicks off? I I, don't, I never use more than three points. You know, I like the rule of three. It's easy for players to remember. So in possession, we're going to work. We're looking for this, this, and this. And out of possession, we're going to look for this, this, and this. And that should also be aligned to what you've been working on in the week in a youth environment. You know, you should have a, a periodised plan uh, and, and work on that. And it should be aligned to that. So then success, success. you know, if, you, if you're judging success on winning and, lo- and, and wins and losses, then you've got a bit of an issue there because no team ever wins every game. And if you do, you're in the wrong league. Um, if success was you've been working on playing out from the back all week, and you say, listen, in possession, boys, I want us to be, or girls, I want you to be able to receive the ball in our defensive third and see if we can progress into the midfield third like we've been working on. If your team loses 2-1, but through the game you successfully did that 12 times, I would take that as a measure of success. So straight away, coaches in the first half have got to be observing. Can't be stood on the sideline, joysticking, whatever you want to call it. No, observing. Are you taking notes? Are you aware of the formation of the opposition? Are you aware of key players? Are your players aware of key players and, and the opposition's formation? And then can you strategize, you know, to to highlight any weaknesses in that? Or do you want to just stick to your plan and go, well, my players are going to deal with this? And again, you know, I don't want to keep going back to Manchester United, but it it did help shape me as a as a young coach to just you know, keep my mouth closed and my eyes open. And, and one of the best things I ever heard from, from Rennie was, listen, if you're talking, you're not observing because your brain's engaged with what you're saying. You're not watching the game and you're not observing the game. We used to get told with the young, with the foundation phase, with the young players, you know, don't talk. When that ball's rolling, don't talk. Let them work it out. Um, and that's a really powerful message. But I think people, no, and, and it's easily done. Coaches see Premier League coaches on the sideline and they want to they wanna imitate and they want to model. But that's a win-at-all-costs environment. People lose their jobs if you lose a game, if you don't win a game, sorry, in six. Um, you know, youth coaches should not be under pressure to win games. They should, be, they should be there as teachers. They should be there to develop players, in my opinion. That's not to say you don't want to win. You know, every game you want to go and win, but but what is the price of that win? Um, is it win at all costs? And then you've got other issues that right there. And and what's the motivation for winning? Is it so you can hang all your U twelve trophies out and show everyone how good of a coach you are, or is it my players are going on a journey and we're developing them? So it's really important that coaches have a process, like you said. What are we looking at? What we're we working on? Am I seeing it as a coach and how can I help them at half time? So my half time is very, very structured. The first two minutes, the players come in and sit down and I leave them to it. I'll let them get a drink. I'll let them sit down. I'll let them start to talk to each other. Then I'll ask them, what do we think? How is it going? Anything we're doing well? And they'll tell us. Nine times out of 10, it's the same things that we're seeing. Is there anything that we can improve on? And again, nine times out of ten, it's the thing that you've got written down in your notes. So players are players are you know, smart. And then from there, it's a case of, okay, how are we going to fix the the things that are not working for us, and how are we going to continue to do the things that are? And that's the halftime talk. And then give them a couple of a couple of minutes before they go back out. And only in the last thirty seconds will there be a bit of an emotive response from me. They'll be right, come on, lads, or girls, let's get going now, let's get out there, one team, all that stuff. But in the very, very final few moments of the half time is the only time I'll get emotive and emotional and and, and show and well, the passion should be there anyway, in terms of just discussing strategies and tactics, but it doesn't need to be kicking water bottles, doesn't you know, I played in dressing room, I've seen I've seen full length mirrors go um <laughs> in non league dressing rooms, so does it need that? I don't think so. Moving now towards a little bit more off the pitch when communication. So I had a message there during the week, Terry Cordero, about he he asked about podcast where you could discuss the challenges of not having enough time with your players. A coach yep. that just has one training session, ninety minutes to make an impact. 
And I thought, well, this chat from you would definitely help with that there. So how important or what ways can coaches build that communication to the work off the pitch as well? Yeah, again, great question. And I'll probably link it back to what we talked about in the start, which is the use of technology now. Um, obviously, you're aware I work for the coaching manual and we, the coaches and the clubs and the teams that utilise the software of what we produce, it's it's co- you know it's for the development of coaches to allow them to improve players. So things like designing a session on the coaching manual and sending it out to your players and parents ahead of time, so straight away they know what the key coaching points are. They can see the video because of our video content with some of our Premier League partners, uh, and they can see what it looks like. So straight away we we've done it where we send session coaches have sent sessions out to players. We got to the point with a team um, back in back in the UK where the young players at 12, 13 years old were coming and setting the session up because they understood what they were about to do. So when you get to that level, you can start to educate players and parents away from the field. And that's when you have impact as well. Um, obviously, you've got to be judged as a coach by what goes on on the field and rightly so. But there is, you know, technology is a way to, to is there to utilise it. And, and young players, you know, they're whiz on iPads. And, and if you can send them a session plan with animation or a video in, we found that they're all over it. They're engaged. They want to, you know, in terms of mirroring and modelling what, what similar age players to themselves are doing. So I'd say technology plays a huge part now because we have got this techno- this generation who are very, very comfortable and, and engaged with technology and technology. It's funny just how we've we've always complained that kids don't watch enough football. And I've always said this that they we don't show them themselves or it's not related to them enough. So we all tell them to watch yeah. matches or watch Barcelona. But you know, when when you start to ask them to engage in what that can help them or ways that can involve them, they're a lot more receptive, right? Absolutely. I think we did we did some research around it and we spoke to quite a few people, you know, at an academic level to say, you know, what what realistically can can young players imitate, and what you know what's the level of engagement? And we found it was a two year age band either side. So if you're a a twelve year old player, if you see a fourteen year old performing a skill or or, or a technique or, or a passage of play, even or a ten year old, you're probably likely to engage and imitate that, and 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 it's not beyond the realms of possibility. If you see Ronaldo doing some of the things he does, then a young player, yes, they will try and imitate, but it's like, well, well that's Ronaldo, or that's an adult even. It doesn't have to be Ronaldo, it can be a, that's an adult, you know, so how am I expected to do that? Um, so again, showing them what other young players can do, and we've had it with coaches, you know, we did it, as you know, with the coaching manager, we've done a lot of filming with Southampton's Academy, which is a fantastic academy. There's young players on our site, five and six years old, doing things. And I've had coaches say to me, yeah, well, our players can't do that. And I went, my response is, why? Why not? If if a five and six-year-old in the UK can do it, a five and six-year-old anywhere on the planet can do it, what exposure have they had? What coaching have they had? And, and have they been allowed to practice these things? Because I would argue that any any player of the same age has the capability to do that. It's just how do we facilitate that? How do we encourage it? How we and it comes back to the the wider wider subject that we're discussing around communication and, and pre planning and, and setting things up for young players to learn the game. Master the ball first before you master the game. Mm-hmm. Really important. So again, when I say it like that to coaches, they go, Oh yeah, well, yeah, no, no, you're right, you're right. And it's it's not about being right or wrong, it's about ensuring young players have the opportunity to develop a love for the game, develop a love for the ball, and then start to understand both. So understand how their body interacts with the ball and understand how they can interact in the game. Yeah. Do, do you think then that, you know, you just said there, the, the content that you guys have created, the work you've done either with academies and the pro clubs and the academics as well, do you think that we grab the culture card a bit too easy over here in terms of, well, We'll never produce X type of player because, you know, because of A, B, and C, really. And maybe we could do a little bit more over here with what we've got. Yeah, I think I think you have to take into account culture. You 100% have to take into account culture. But 
again, the cultural, the culture doesn't have to be the expectations or the standard. It's just something you have to consider. So, you know, we, we, we've got, we've got an office out in Spain and, and the culture is very different to the UK, which is very different to the U S but it's drilling down again. You know, we speak to, we speak to Lee out in Spain all the time and he's like, not every young player out here is playing tiki taka football and playing through the thirds. A lot of it can be very direct, but one thing what is common within the Spanish culture is that technical mastery. It's young players are working hard to, to develop the technique on the ball and deal with the ball. So, um, culture, I, I think you can shape and mold culture. You've got to take into account current cultures, um, and then you set your standards and expectations to say during this time frame, this is what we want to achieve. Um, in the US, my my personal opinion, the US have the best trainers on the planet in terms of what I mean by that is players will train hard. They will give everything. They they want more walking off the field. They, any feedback, coach, what can I work on? What can I be better on? And it comes back to that. If they've got that thirst and that hunger to be better, again, if we're only out there for 90 minutes, what else can we give them? And again, technology links into that individual player stuff and, 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 and small unit stuff to go away and work on and challenge. And, and that is honestly my opinion. I think that the, the young people here are, are fantastic. They want to work hard. They want to be better. I think the next level is in that connecting the dots, understanding my role within a unit and understanding my role within the team. Um, and again, coaches don't have to jump early. You don't have to be te- teaching players how to play as an inverted fullback at U9. And, you know, <laughs> and I said that flippantly, but it's, you know, have they mastered the ball first? Mm. You know, do they understand relationships on the field? Do they understand the, the, the nature of the game? Let them play, let them work it out. When they start getting a little, tactics can be a part of every session, but you know, again, coming back to the communication piece, how what are we explaining to players? How are we explaining it to them? Do they understand, you know, I hear it on the sideline all the time, press, press, young players, and I mean young players playing 7v7 and 9v9 in the US, press, well, there's so much to consider. So I'm pressing, well, who's pressing? Where are we pressing? What's our line? You know, where's our line of engagement if you want to use that word? These young players can't just be expected to run around and, and and go after the ball, you know, like a dog in a park. They've got to, that takes time. Yeah, okay, I'm the nearest player to the ball. I'm going to go and try and win that ball back. And if my teammate's gone, do I recognise, right, I've got to go and help them. I've got to go and support them, but I can't be next to them. I need to be a bit deeper. And again, how we explain that and how we expect young people to be able to deliver it Coaches have fantastic information now. There's so much out there on social media, on different platforms. But again, what is relevant for that young person? We can, Gary, me and you and other coaches in this country can have talks and, and use all sorts of terminology and we'll all understand. But are we expecting seven, eight, nine and 10 year olds to understand that? Even 12, 13, 14 year olds mm. in that context. Would you walk into a first team dressing room and start talking about you know, verticality and things like that, I'd argue you may not. So, again, communication, can you be clear? Can you be concise? And is it age appropriate? Do these young people understand it? So do we check for understanding? There's another one. It's no good saying everyone got that because no player's going to go, no, I didn't understand what you said, coach. Everyone nods their head, yes. So you've got to go around and target people. You know, what are we doing then in possession? What do we do if that player's got the ball there? And if they can answer you, then you've got that check for understanding. Staying on that then, communicating a philosophy from a club, because now every club, and, and rightly so, wants to have a, an effective philosophy, a consistent philosophy from top to bottom. Wanted to get your thoughts on how DOCs can communicate their club philosophy. How can one differentiate from the other? How can it be special today without everything looking almost copied and pasted or like... Uh, you know, like a PowerPoint. Great question. I think I think I thought, and I said it this week. I was having a conversation this week about philosophy and standards. A philosophy can't exist on a PowerPoint. It just can't. It has to be lived and breathed every day. It's everything you're doing as an individual within the club, 
as teams within the club, as coaching staff within the club. So the first protocol for a DLC is to establish what the philosophy of the club is. That may take buying and ownership from other coaches. You may have to sit on a round table and, and have it out for a few days. How do we want to play? How do we want to develop people? How do we want to develop players? What are we already doing? What's great? Where do we need to improve on? Um, and then secondly, you know, I, I'm a, I, I'm from an education background as well as a qualified teacher. And I think for, for young people and for youth players, there needs to be a curriculum and it needs to be consistent across the age groups. So developing that curriculum or utilising a curriculum what fits with how you want to develop players, linked in with your style of play, um, and finding coaches who buy into that. Um, you know, again, with the coaching manual, with the season planning tool, DOCs can create or send out pre-populated season plans to every coach within the club. And I've used this for a number of years, and that allows... First and foremost, consistency across the board. So now as a parent with a young player in a club, you're not at the look of the drawer of what coach you get. You've actually, you actually, the club can stand up and the DLC can stand up and say, we have a plan for your child. This is our plan. Linked in with our philosophy, linked in with our style of play. These are the, this is the curriculum and these, this is the season plan. And again, communicating that season plan out to your coaches. So again, using software to get that out there to your coaches and your coaching staff and then the DOC there is is there to ensure that it's living and breathing on the field walking around the field and if the session of the week is in possession in the defensive third and building out from the back and another coach is off delivering you know diving headers then you rightly so you're going to question that coach um on top of that there's got to be flexibility within any plan you know um, I said to coaches who work off plans what I, I've helped develop with other people and with, with coaches within the club, I say, listen, if you need to come off plan because something you believe needs urgently addressing, then absolutely come off plan. But the minute you believe it's addressed, you've got to get back onto the plan and back onto the curriculum. Otherwise, we'll continue to be reactive. We can't just keep reacting to what's happened on a weekend. There has to be a process has to be a long-term development. Again, you wouldn't drop your child off at school and ask the teacher, what what they're working on today? Oh, well, they didn't do great at math yesterday, so I'm going to work on it today. There's got to be a plan. There's got to be, there's got to be a long-term plan because then that long-term plan is measurable. It's actionable. You can look at how much in possession to out of possession you're doing. If you, if you do technical work within the club or is it all game-based activities? Is it all, you know, which methodology are you using? Um, having that plan then means standards and expectations can be aligned, means you can hold coaches and players accountable. You can share that plan at the start of the season with players and parents so they know what you're going to be working on. Um, and it gives you something to come back and reflect on and discuss. And again, plans can change, but you've got to have a plan, in my opinion. That moment we said about the go the coach doing diving headers there, and you're the DOC and you've walked past. So, what are ways that a DOC could communicate that there with the coach? That you know, is it more? You know, we talk a lot about feedback from coach to player, but how much should DOC to coach be having these interactions, these feedback, or should that just be any time you see something wrong, you just pick up the phone or send them an email? What's the best way there? Great question. I think it should be week by week. I think every week you should be touching base with your coaches. And I know there's a, there's a club pretty local to me who are using our platform for exactly that. Um, and, and the club has got a new DLC in there with a great background in the professional game back home, actually. But that's not the point. It, the, the DLC at the local club I'm talking about asks for, he sends out the curriculum based on the, on the coaching manual. Um, aligned with their style of play. And he, he asks every week for his coaches to take a screenshot of their plan, send it back to him in the folders in, in on the on the site, and then he will ask for reflection. So straight away, how did the session go? What went well? What could we improve on? And every coach within the club is doing that. And that's a 10, 15-minute job, it can be. It, it's, you know, it's not a massive amount of time, but the DOC is ensuring that he's got a, a handle and a, and a and a, and a base with every coach in the club and he's encouraging that plan, do, review, cycle straight away. Um, and then it's about prioritising. If there's a coach who desperately needs support, then, it, then they may need prioritising. But ensuring in any 
block of work, 12 weeks, whatever, that you can get round all of your coaches. And it's not there. It's not there as a stick, you know, it's not there to, to beat people. So the delivery and the communication with coaches is, listen, I'm here to support you. It's another set of eyes. It's a, it's it's someone who, who can step back and look at what's happening and give you some support to be better. Um, and I think when delivered the right way, coaches are, are, are all over that. I, I've got no problem in anyone at any sort of level coming and watching me deliver. And that's not because I think I'm, I'm a world-class coach. It's because I want feedback. I want someone to say, why did you do this? And what were you thinking with that set up? And because that's the challenge, that's the game. You've got to question each other and be able to justify why you're doing what you're doing. Or say, you know what, I didn't even think about that. I should be doing that, shouldn't I? Brilliant. Now we've had a, a light bulb moment and now we move on and become even better. And the, and the biggest thing for that is the players get that experience then. The players benefit from the coach's development. And we ask players to be open-minded and continuous learners. If we're not that ourselves as a coach, then you know we shouldn't be asking other people to do it, in my opinion. So to answer your question, you, you should be touching base with your coaches as, as often as possible. Um, give them the tools and resources. Um, like the season plans, like the session planning software, they want to plan their own on the theme of the week. Um, and then make sure you're checking in with them. Everything okay? How did your session go? I looked at your reflection here. Should we sit down and have a coffee and discuss this? Um, then you create that culture, that culture of continuously moving forwards and developing. You mentioned before about being reactive and how much that can negatively impact a club. This is specifically for coach development. And then whenever you look at that DOC question, you're saying, all right, well, if you're in a club and you're dealing with, you know, 50, how many coaches that are that are within the club, this, the vastness of America has created different sorts of pockets of coaches who do not have any access. The amount of high school coaches or club coaches that because of the resources don't even have an assistant coach um, who could be less than going, I want to get better. I would love for someone to be watch walking past my sessions. I would love to be in an area where I could drive 10, 15 minutes an hour, go watch someone else work. But I'm in X state and there's no other, there's not a lot of soccer around. How can that coach specifically get feedback? Is there a way that they can improve without having to jump on a plane three times a month? Yeah, great question. And, Again, to answer that, you know, we've been very fortunate to have access through the League Managers Association to film some top, top level coaches. We, we did a session with David Moyes um, at St George's Park in England with the coaching manual. And again, imagine the cost to be able to get in front of a former Premier League manager, your flights, your hotel, seeing that, or just jumping online and watching it in the comfort of your own living room. Um, are you going to get feedback back into the coach potentially not at that moment but what you're going to get is a re, you know reaffirming what you're doing is correct or in line with not correct in line with what's happening um in the modern game or you know i may have to change i may have to may have to reflect i may have to change my strategy and and x's and o's are all over all over the, the the internet you know i'm under no illusion you can google any topic and pull out a session plan when you see somebody deliver that session plan whether it is a video um or in in person all of a sudden for me you see the most powerful thing which is how they delivered it what's the manner what's the tone communication again you know what's the setup um, how are they interacting with players? That's massive. Really, you know, there's a there's a bit in the David Moyes session where he says to one of the players, he starts laughing when a player beat when a uh, an opposition player beat him. I wouldn't laugh if I was you. Come on, we're in. And again, he's not calling him out. He's just saying standards. This is the standard and, and delivered the right way. And the player gets right back into the session. So again, we we deal with that all the time on a daily basis with 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 players. And, and it's again, you know mirroring and modeling what's going on and putting your own personality onto it as well so again the, the more you my opinion the more you can expose yourself to that stuff as a coach i think and the more open-minded you are you may see things that you don't like and that's fine but again do you understand the rationale do you understand the justification yeah i understand why Moyes did that i understand why mark warburton did that um that isn't my style or that might not work for me but I understand why he, why he took that approach. 
again, just just going through the process all the time of, of self-reflection, of analysis, um, and keeping yourself open, open to that. And again, you know, video is such a powerful tool now. And, and on our site, the coaching manual, you can upload your own video. You should be sending that to your DOC or, or, or a friend of yours can be in, in an opposite state or an opposite country. Just say, have a look at this session I delivered. You know, I filmed it with a HiPod or a GoPro. Just just give us some feedback on that. What do you think? Um, let me know your thoughts. Um, again, just just be creating that that culture of we're all in it together. We've got to we've got to challenge each other. You know, people. Social media is fantastic, but there's that undercurrent of, you know, I know best. You're wrong. You're wrong. The, the bottom line is there is no right and wrong in the game. You, you can play this game a million and one different ways. Is there a right and wrong with how you how you should be delivering and communicating with young people? Absolutely. Um, but again, don't be don't be threatened if somebody says, you know, I don't agree with that. All right. Why don't you agree with it? What would you suggest? What would you do in this situation? That's a very different conversation in, in terms of, you know, I'm right and you're wrong. We've got to be open minded enough to justify what we're doing and accept that not everyone's going to agree with that, that process and that model. And that's the beauty of the game. All right, so you're now we're now in an era or a, or a generation of where technology has changed, but also coach development has changed to where maybe the ambitions of young coaches become that and you mentioned before about wanting to get the next job or wanting to get the best job. And, you know, the, the reality is that there is a large number of coaches today who are hungry to advance and progress to higher levels and to whatever X job. Is there a right or wrong way that that coach can communicate their, I suppose, their coaching brand today? You know, not, you know, said before about getting pictures of trophies or is it posting sessions? How can coaches show that they're they're hungry and that they're trying to get better rather than, yeah. you know, that they don't want to be, because Twitter can go a different number of ways today as well. So what yes. are your thoughts on that? Um. Gary, you've probably got more experience in that realm than me as a, as a former college coach and, you know, understanding that anything you put out there is there for everyone to see. Um, so first and foremost, Ali, a good person. We, we all know stories of young people who posted something on social media and all of a sudden the college scholarship's gone or you know, not so much professional contracts, but that will probably be the be a decider in, in people being offered professional contracts at clubs as well. First and foremost, are they a good person? And that comes down to a coach as well. You know, are, are you a good person? Are you accepting, you know, responses? Are you open to, oh, well, you know, that dialogue we just discussed? That's the first thing. Um, if coaches want to want to post trophies, you know, that that's fine. It's, it's not my personal preference. Um, but that's fine because... It, the most important bit is not we've won, we've won, we've won. It, it should be this is the process and you know what? An outcome of it is we've actually won something, but it's down to the process that we've all been working towards. That that message is very different from what, what we've won again. Um, look how good I am. Um, so again, are you respecting the process? Are you respecting the game? I think coaches who share session plans, fantastic. You know, why not? Let, let's challenge, let's debate. But again, if somebody challenges you on it, you don't have to be defensive. You don't have to say, oh, well, well, what do you know? And I've worked here and I've done this and I've done that. It doesn't matter. It's a footballing community or a soccer community. We should be able to share stuff. Uh, so, again, my my biggest thing um, is if you're going to be a coach and you've got ambitions, get yourself on the field. Get, get grass under your boots. Get out there. Work with players as much as you can. Um, coming back to the comment we made earlier about, you know, philosophies don't exist on PowerPoints. They exist by living and breathing them. Again, coaches, coaches shouldn't be good because they can put a PowerPoint together or, or a fantastic uh, analysis session together. That That is part of it. But coaches should be judged by what they do on the field. The PowerPoint stuff, the planning, the session planning is, is part of that role. But just because you can create a 42-page document on a specific tactical strategy doesn't mean you're a good coach, in my opinion. I want to know, as a coach educator, as a DOC, I want to know, can you get on the field and deliver that in an age-appropriate manner? And when the players come off, three things. Did they learn something? 
did they give you a hundred percent and did they work hard with this sweating and were they smiling in it and you know was it fun it's a game them are the three measures and they're the measures at any level they're the measure they're measures at first team level in in the professional game because if players are taking information on board and they're giving you everything and they're enjoying it you're probably going to have success mm. if you if you do if you're delivering sessions to a u6 group of players did they learn something while well, you're helping them d- develop the game and when when young people start to understand what they're doing and can see that they're improving they stay in it did they give you a hundred percent again difficult to measure with a u6 but um, <laughs> are, they, are they engaged you know do they want to play are they having fun and 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 that's the that's the last one you know are they smiling when you say who's coming back next week and all hands go up that's success that's success as a coach because you've created that environment the tactical stuff we can give them later on um or we can implement it slowly slowly you've got to get them coming back you've got to develop that love for the game first and foremost because especially in the us and i think more so globally now especially in europe and the uk there's a lot of other options now you don't have to go and play soccer or football you you know there's lots of other options so do they develop that love for the game? Do they want to come back next week and be better? Do they want to come and have fun with their friends? And and that for me, that's at most levels. You know, even the professional game, the players want to want to work hard, learn something, and, and have a laugh doing it. So brilliant! What a way to finish it, Brady. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. No problem, Gary. First class. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much to Paul for his time and his insight there. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I think that's a topic that's becoming more and more important in coaching today and as the world is changing, this coaching is changing with it at a very, very fast rate and and he mentioned technology there and where coaching used to be, the importance of coaching communication. When I first started coaching was all about, you know, your coaching points and how much you're talking to players and the manner in which you're talking to players and I, I think that's a significantly small piece today because of two reasons. Yeah, number one, the role of technology and how it's changing how we consume information and how it's changing how we take on the game and how it's changing how even us as coaches take on information. So adapting towards the players' needs rather than you know sitting in a classroom for 45, 50 minutes or, or sitting them down in the middle of a pitch for 15, 20 minutes at a time doesn't really have the same impact what it had 20 years ago. And the second reason is, I think, individualization of the sport and goes along with where society is moving. And yeah, it's been impacted as well by technology. Everyone has their own phones, everyone has their own social media subscription. You know, people can design their own cleats today, people can design their own trainers, people can design their own clothes. And they want that there in coaches today. So it's not enough to just to focus on the collective. It's not enough just to do a training session and say, there we go, this is why we're doing it. Have a good attitude, get on with it and we'll improve as a team. I don't think that's enough today. So what I'm fascinated by is how coaches are going above and beyond that and how coaches are delving into a little bit of business, delving into a little bit of education, delving into a little bit of entertainment. We had Yao Nuno Fonseca on here last week talking about how you could possibly send scouting reports through Instagram and you know when you present that to coaches, the looks you get. But that's where the game's going. That's where the game's going. So I thought Paul did a great job in kind of balancing. He's got some principles there that he strongly believes in that, that you could call old-fashioned, like respect, good manners, earning the trust of all the players. But then you know, he's, he's forward-thinking, he's open-minded to, to look at how coaches can improve beyond that there. And I think that's a good way of looking at it. You know, the, the old-fashioned work will always be there because it's a people business. But if you really want to impact players today... I think you've got to be open to, you know, getting into their phones, getting into their laptops, get involving the parents and all these different things because as those connections get stronger and stronger, your influence gets stronger and stronger and the player feels a little bit more involved, feels a little bit more engaged and, and, and it's finding the balance and how to do that without going too far one way or the other. So really enjoyed it. Would love to hear your thoughts as always at Gary Kernin on Twitter, at Gary Kernin on Instagram. Thanks so much for listening for the podcast. I'll speak to you soon. Have a great week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, 
Head on over to Coach Kernine on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com. 